For the people who are entering the room, good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to be having um, a wonderful talk with Jonathan Ned Katz on his just published book, The Daring Life in Dangerous Times of Eve Adams. Um, and I'm looking forward to this personally, as well as um, having known about the tea room at 129 McDougal Street, um, just south of Washington Square Park, Greenwich Village. And um, I think I can't tell how many, oh, we have 17 people in there. Um, so we're going to wait for more people to enter. It's now 627. So we've got about 100 people signed up. I'm not sure how many people will be entering the, pro, you know, the uh, event, but we want to give everybody ample time. I'm going to go to the next screen. So if people are joining us, this is our, these are our upcoming events. Um, this Friday, we're having an Instagram live at the Henry Street Settlement, um, where we're currently working with the settlement and Katie Vogel on um, the LGBT associations with Lillian Wald, who was one of the founders. Um, and these Instagram live events are rather fun because it allows people to see uh, spaces, institutions, um, and historic sites related to LGBT history with not necessarily going there, uh, but they're very quick 30 minute, 20 minute events that allows us to go inside or meet there and you can then join us virtually. Um, and then June 8th and 9th, you could see we're having a village drag uh, discussion that is sponsored, we're co-sponsors with Village Preservation. And then we'll be sending out all, a whole list of this on our um, an email blast. But I'm particularly looking forward to the LGBT trivia night uh, with George uh, Benson, who's a real bona fide British pub host and also a project consultant who's been writing some of our entries. Um, and as, as the list goes on, we've, we've got a busy month for Pride. Um, so there are still some people in the waiting room. I have to see how many people are here. We've got about 24 people uh, in the participants. So, and how we're gonna be working this today is I'm gonna provide some context about Greenwich Village, but Jonathan will then be doing a presentation on Eve Adams and we'll then open it up to a Q&A. <clears throat> so forgive me while I also just happen to want to look at the list of individuals who's in here. Um, and again, I can't see everybody necessarily, but um, for those who are joining us, um, this is really wonderful to have Jonathan and Ned Katz, um, who's sort of a groundbreaking historian with LGBT history dating back to the 1970s. Um, and to have him here discussing this new publication that just came out is wonderful. Um, he's taken a sort of a footnote to history that was sort of mentioned in, in publications um, and really literally made Eve come to life um, and made this anonymous footnote into a very full life of activism uh, resistance and terrible sadness um, and and death. Um, so this is just really going to be wonderful. Um, we've got about 30 people in here and I'm just checking the time. It's 630. Um, and what I'll do is because a lot of you have probably joined us before, I'll, I'm going to switch to sort of my presentation part of it. And that way I'm not holding any of you people up in your lives. Um, because some of you or a lot of you have may have already seen this presentation, um, which is basically a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Um, so again, let me just start here. Um, for those joining us, I'm just going to say one more time, we're here with Jonathan Ned Katz, uh, The Daring and Dangerous Life of Eve Adams, which is a book that just came out, Chicago Review Press. And I'll hold up a copy here, um, which is wonderful to see. Um, and if you go to our website, you will be able to see all our upcoming events. But I'm going to start the presentation now. 
in terms of just who we are and what we're doing. As many of you know, the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project is a cultural heritage initiative and educational resource. We're documenting LGBT historic sites throughout New York City from the 17th century to the year 2000. Um, this past week, we um, published our 350th site on our map, uh, which is quite a milestone for us, considering we started five years ago. And each of these sites is an, um, is, is an annotated entry uh, to preservation standards. We discuss um, the cultural significance, historic significance, and so forth of each site, broken down by building type, time period, and so forth that you can filter. Um, and if you hear that noise, it's because of my inability to advance my slides quickly. Um, we also have made it easy, easier for people. We have 23 themes related to LGBT sites. As we do more research, we're able to create this cultural landscape and then tease out specific themes to provide context. So we have a number of these themes that you can go to on our website and then uh, advance and go into the map itself that way. So you're not wandering around the map on your own. Um, another big push in why the program started was that we um, got a grant uh, five years ago to increase the underrepresentation of LGBT people on the National Register of Historic Places. The National Register is the federal government's um, list of important sites that have national significance. This, for example, uh, is the Alice Austin House on Staten Island. Um, last, in the last, really last month, we had two more sites that we nominated get listed. That was um, the Lorraine Hansberry House at 337 Bleecker Street, where she wrote A Raisin in the Sun. And just uh, this week, the Women's Liberation Center on West 22nd Street was put on the National Register. So New York State is leading um, with the number of National Register nominations. Um, and we are, I should pat myself on the back or if the team on the back are really the leaders around the country in doing this work. Um, and it, we have to thank the federal government for that support that helped launch the project. We also do presentations such as this. We've done walking tours, hopefully, we will be doing them in person again as we emerge from the pandemic. Um, and we have a robust social media presence. If you don't know about us on um, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, please follow us. But really, the, the crux of all our material is on our website. And really, um, since LGBT history is about people and their lives, we're asking you to make sure you can suggest sites for us because um, your history, uh, your snapshot is our archival record. So anything you have or want to suggest, you can email us. Um, so now I'm going to just go to the meat of tonight's event, which is the book published by Jonathan. Um, and this was Jonathan last week outside of Eve's Hangout at 129 McDougal. And this is a picture of Eve um, from a 1941 passport photo. Jonathan Ed Katz is the author of four pioneering books on LGBTQ history and one pioneering book on heterosexual history. His seminal play, Coming Out, a documentary play about gay life and liberation in the USA, premiered at the GAA Firehouse um, in June of 1972. In 1973, he was a founding member of the Gay Academic Union, and he founded Out History, Dot org, which went online in 2008. And that's an incredible resource of, of information for LGBTQ historians and others. Um, he has also taught at Yale and numerous other academic institutions. So it's really wonderful to have Jonathan here as a trailblazer of LGBT history and research. Um, but I'm gonna start briefly providing context for the neighborhood that we're gonna be studying today, which is primarily Washington Square South um, and the area of McDougal Street, which emerged um, in, the, in the late 19th century as a gay enclave. But one can see um, facts, which if some of you, I can't tell if you're getting, if your own, if the little um, thumbnails are covering it, but that's in the lower left. 
um, area, which in the 1850s was a Rathskeller popular for Bohemian men, including Walt Whitman, where um, he would go to, other men would pick up men. Um, and then as the area declined, it became uh, a place of affordable rents for people to open up other locations. And I'm gonna talk about one of them, such as the slide, which by the 1890s was known as one of the worst dives in New York City. Um, it was on the police sort of radar as a place where effeminate men would go uh, to pick up other men. This was a little sketch that was in one of the papers. Um, the Mills House number one is at 160 Bleecker Street. That was opened in 1897. And ironically, um, it, it became a place for gay men. Um, it was built as middle-class housing for men to keep them segregated from others. So it would be a wholesome place in this image here on the right where you could see them dining. Um, but it became desirable for gay men because it became sort of this insular, isolated, or I shouldn't say isolated, but you can socialize much more easily there. Um, and George Chauncey identified this location and it was well known because of the number of arrests that were made for people who were living there. Uh, the arrest for solicitation by undercover police and so forth. Um, and this touches on the level of harassment and surveillance of that period. Um, again, prior to World War I, the area emerged as a, as a sort of desirable place for um, LGBT people and Bohemians. Um, this, you know, many artistically, you know, uh, it was an artist enclave as well, but this area of the village tolerated and then eventually accepted gay people um, in terms of uh, restaurants, tea rooms, and so forth. This is the Mad Hatter between 1916 and 1930, uh, located in the basement here. You can see this um, photo on the right from the early 20th century. It was a gay and lesbian friendly place that uh, eventually it, in 1945, it turned into the, was rechristened the Pony Stable as a lesbian bar that was there through 1970. Um, but this area, again, this is on McDougal Street. This area really emerged as the most progressive um, part of the South Village. Um, upper left is uh, Polly's Tea Room. That's at 137 McDougal Street. That is where the Liberal Club and the Heterodoxy Club uh, met. Um, uh, Washington Square Bookshop was at 135 Bleecker, uh, McDougal Street. That was also very well known um, for, uh, for, for its radical books and so forth. Provincetown Playhouse at 139. Uh, obviously most closely associated with Eugene O'Neill, but also was uh, well known for actors and playwrights who were LGBT or LGB. And, um, and then the Whitney Studio on 8th Street opened um, not, the, not as the museum, but as the precursor to the museum just around the corner. Um, and the one surviving sort of known location to this uh, world was Eve's Hangout, which opened here in 1924. Um, and I'll let Jonathan talk about Eve Adams and I'll let him pronounce her Polish name, which I will not pronounce properly. But this is it uh, in 1933 and 1939. It operated there from 1924 to 1926 as a very LGBT friendly place. Um, and this is where you would enter it from the, um, the, the cellar entrance. On the right is the screenshot. We did an Instagram live event there with Jonathan last week. And if you go in there, you can actually see the space as it, or the walls, I should say, as Eve saw them. Um, it's still intact, which is pretty remarkable. And then I'm gonna let Jonathan then sort of introduce himself and say hello and annotate these images from his publication, from the book, before we go into his presentation. So Jonathan, I'm gonna pass it over to you um, to just give us some background on Eve's, uh, these images that we're gonna see, and then you could do the presentation. What's gonna happen if you have questions or um, wanna pose any questions, put them in the chat. What we're gonna do is turn off the um, sort of shared screen so you won't be able to see each other or chat with each other, but you will be able to spotlight. Jonathan and myself will be spotlit. And then at the end, we're gonna open it up so everybody could see each other and ask questions. So I'm gonna to toss it over to Jonathan now. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, this is a picture of Eve in the middle. Uh, and she's wearing um, a suit that she might have made herself and uh, Oxfords. It looks like Oxfords. And the ad is uh, with her hair in exactly the same. Uh, it's an ad for her uh, sales services, I believe, uh, with her hair exactly in the same style as her, this 1925 picture that she had taken when she went to revisit her family in Poland. Let's see the next. And what, uh, J Jonathan, I remember reading her, her hair was a, a vibrant red, correct? Just to get a sense of what she looked like. Yes, people, number of reports say that she had bright red hair. Some say that she had brown hair. So it's hard to know exactly. Maybe she dyed it for a while she, so she would stand out as a saleswoman of radical periodicals. Uh, that's where she lived at 38 Washington Square. Um, it's no longer there. But it's wonderful uh, that the Sites Project found a, uh, found a picture of, yes. No, we lost you for a second. Okay, I won't. Of where Eve lived. So the next picture. Um, these are pictures from Lesbian Love, the book that Eve wrote in 1925 and got in trouble for. It was called an obscene book. And these were the, there were four illustrations and they were no more, ero uh, you know, explicitly erotic than what you see here. But they were, she was accused of having obscene pictures in her obscene book. Next one. Uh, Eve's passport is 1934, but it's really from 1939. Uh, uh, and Eve's picture a, taken in Paris in 1934. She's getting a little older. Uh, and look, she just sort of looks pretty tough in that one. So that was in Paris where she had uh, was living. Next picture. Uh, Eve with her companion, Hella of later years, Hella. Uh, Olstein Saldner, and um, we could talk more about her later. She, they they were very very close from in in Lips and uh, later in France, uh, elsewhere in France. Yes. So that gives you some um, tangible images of of Eve, who was really just sort of this footnote. I was saying earlier, um, but I want to toss it to Jonathan for his presentation. Um, but I'll just ask you maybe as a prompt for that, how did you discover Eve? Um, we learned about her um, in George Chauncey's book, Gay New York. Um, and what prompted you to sort of want to uncover this, this story that we're going to hear about now? A review of a book in the New York Times book review in December 1st, I think. Uh, 2016, and I came across a, a mention of a Polish Jewish immigrant who had made a lesbian advance to a policewoman, and I didn't remember a thing about her. I didn't remember ever having read about her. So I started investigating. My, my policy is to always look for what has been researched don't invent the wheel. So I found that there was quite a bit of information and I tried to separate, you know, the, the, the evidence from, from the, the, the gossip. And um, so it led to my writing this book as I found there was more and more interesting material. And with that, I will just begin a brief overview of Eve's life. Eve Speaks. On November 30th, 1926, at Eve Adams' deportation hearing at the Women's Penitentiary on Welfare Island, now Roosevelt Island, Eve responded to the charge that she had published in in book. I admit having written a book titled Lesbian Love based on true acts and living characters of today. 
the object of the book was to show the exact things that are happening from day to day. And every character is a true character, except she is given an assumed name. I believe the book is not in any way immoral, indecent, or vulgar. There is not one word in the whole book that is vulgar. I can't see why I should be singled out and sentenced to imprisonment for writing my book, which was only meant to show the humorous side of life. And tragedy all in one. Born Kavaz Lotchever in Poland in, uh, to a Jewish family in 1891, uh, Eve uh, immigrated to the U.S. in 1912. She immediately got in uh, as a 21-year-old uh, with uh, famous anarchists, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, and she got to know the larger-than-life Ben Lewis Reitman, who had been Emma Goldman's uh, lover, her the main lover. Life. In New York City, Eve worked in the garment industry in a sweatshop factory and was a member of the Progressive Ladies Waste Makers Union. Those were makers of women's blouses. Uh, one of the lesbians profiled in Eve's book is named Little Jimmy, and she may actually be Eve. Little Jimmy works in a ladies waste shop and goes on vacation to a hotel started by her union. I figured out that this or resort was probably Unity House in Bushkill, Pennsylvania, initiated by uh, radical Jewish women garment workers. These women argue to their doubting male comrades that uh, working class solidarity would be enhanced if union members had a country place to dance. Uh, little Jimmy dances with a woman at the resort, and this leads to a romantic and sexual encounter. And um, there's lots about gender in uh, Eve's story. In Eve's book, she talks a lot about gender issues. Eve's narrator says uh, of Little Jimmy, Little Jimmy did not, uh, Little did <laughs> little did Jimmy know of her. Little she knew, skill and spark within her. All she did know was that she felt far more comfortable in boyish clothes. She could run better, climb trees better, and feel unhampered uh, in every action. That quote, masculine spark a male-typed yearning to run, climb trees, pursue boys' activities, wear boys' clothes, and feel free is a repeated poignant theme in several early narratives of persons born female who rejected restrictive feminine norms. Although Jim tell in quote, enjoying this boyish freedom. No one frowns on her clothes or, or activity, so she is perfectly at ease. Elsewhere, it seems, Jimmy's clothes and swagger, and probably Eve's, had solicited, uh, uh, elicited uh, criticism. Uh, after several years, Eve got tired of factory work, and by 1918, she had probably begun to sell radical periodicals, including the Yiddish humor magazine, Der Kreuzer Kundes, lit of the big prankster. Eve had dinner one night with Jakob uh, Maranoff, editor of The Big Prankster, and Jacob's sister, the actress, Fania Maranoff, who was also at the dinner, uh, along with her husband, Carl Van Vechten, who was mostly homosexual, but this marriage to Fania uh, lasted 50 years with ups and downs, but it, it lasted that long. Fania was then starring in a Greenwich Village theater in a play advocating free love. Eve was enchanted by the actress and wrote her a fervid fan letter. 
she said, I saw nothing else but your beautiful dark big eyes, which are hidden under those long, long eyelashes. Yet I saw your soul made me sure to respect you so much more than an ordinary actor. You were not an actress, Miss Marinoff. You were a great artist and may be compared with the world's greatest. Eve started making a living as a touring saleswoman of radical periodicals. Because of her association with left radical causes and famous anarchists, Eve started to uh, be surveilled by the Bureau of Investigation, the forerunner of the FBI. The young Justice Department, Eden Edgar Hoover, who we know later as J. Edgar, initiated much of this surveillance of Eve because of what the Bureau called, and he called, radical activities. And that was selling these radical periodicals. That's how the radical the activities were. Um, the agent's reports that are documented, um, I think, are amazing. And do it in anti gender bending comments that are just blatant sometimes in these Bureau of Investigation agents' reports. A Los Angeles agent commented on Eve's appearance quote, Jewish type, hair cropped, short that meant, complexion, hmm, he's commenting on skin color, medium, not quite all white as she should be. A not attractive, he says, wears nose glasses. This is what uh, citizens were paying for their uh, investigative agents to say. A citizen informer, uh, Dr. Charles T. Bayless, walked into the San Francisco uh, Bureau office uh, to inform on Eve. Bayless described Eve to the Justice Department Quote, she has short, fuzzy red hair, dresses mannishly, and is dirty, greasy, and Jewish in appearance. Those were standard words said about immigrants, uh, you know, dirty, greasy, and, uh, you know, about many kinds of immigrants. Bayless was touring the U.S. in 1919, presenting a speech titled, Making a Better America. Sound familiar? Bayless had the court, the alien red, put the native born traitor in jail, restrict immigration to desirable persons and teach Americanism in the public schools. Around 1921 and 1922, Eve settled in Chicago with a beloved woman partner, Ruth Norlander, an artist. They opened a queer, friendly, bohemian cafe called the, the Gray Cottage. They advertised it as Chicago's Greenwich Village Tea Room. I love that, that uh, in the Midwest, in Chicago, uh, Greenwich Village was represented high Bohemia. Eve Adams and Ruth Norlander in charge, the ad said. I like that, in charge. It sort of was a signal, I think, to lesbians and gay men that these uh, two women were in charge. Uh, poet Kenneth Raxroth recalled the Gray Cottage as, quote, much the most bohemian of the bohemian tea rooms of the Chicago North Side. One unhappy visitor to the cottage called it that refuge of thwarted intellect whose atmosphere, one soiled menu card, one frowsy haired proprietress, proprietress who borrows cigarettes. That was probably Eve, I guess. Um, Numerous Chicago newspaper ads for the Gray Cottage referred to Eve's friend Ben Reitman as chairman of weekly talks. One talk was on vice and virtue in the village. I guess that meant Greenwich Village. A talk by Reitman with, quote, hot discussion. Another talk was on sexuality in American fiction. 
in 1920, uh, had split with Norlander and came back to New York City. And there in Greenwich Village, in the basement of 129 McDougal Street, she opened another queer and bohemian friendly cafe, he Eve's Hangout. Um, after Eve had gotten in trouble, the uh, industry, uh, entertainment industry, trade paper, Variety reported, Portland, her tea room, acted masculine attire and become a regular at the various resorts catering to temperamentals, those were homosexuals. When Eve opened her tea room, this is still a quote, when Eve opened her tea room on McDougal Street, the paper alleged, she had given the tip off of what kind of joint it was through placating placarding the main entrance with a sign which read, men are admitted but not welcome. That sign probably never existed. It is not mentioned in any other source, and its words suspiciously promote the stereotype of and haters. In 1925, Eve Adams risked all to write and publish a book titled Lesbian Love. It was really pioneering. It, there's nothing else like it. It briefly uh, pictures about two dozen women, and it amounts to uh, what I've called a pioneering lesbian community study. One of the best sections of Eve's book is titled How I Found Myself. Uh, in this, an unnamed narrator describes her first sexual experience with a woman at age 19. The first person narrator suggests that two years before Eve embarked for the US, she had experienced a sensual encounter that her narrator recalls as beautiful and one of the most significant events of my life. Eve's surveillance by Bureau of Investigation uh, Agents and immigration officials led to used immigration officials, the New York City police, and a biased informer and a number of state employees were all out to get her. I have documented an actual conspiracy between a judge, uh, parole officials, and immigration officials to deport Eve, who had never uh, become a, a, a citizen, which Um, Eve was convicted uh, by uh, this conspiracy of people of publishing an obscene book. She was also convicted of a second charge, attempted sex with a policewoman sent to entrap her. Adams was jailed for a year and a half, then deported. Eve lived and worked in France for 13 years selling what were considered dirty books in English that US and British tourists could not yet buy in their own countries. Along with Fanny Hill, Eve sold books by James Joyce, Aeneas Nin, D.H. Lawrence, and Henry Miller, with whom Eve became very good friends. written in the New York Tribune, which was published in Paris, despite its name, in a column by a, uh, an American journalist with an unusual name of Wombly Bald. Eve Bald uh, called Eve, quote, one of the few females who never criticizes other women. Bald then added, Eve had been, quote, asked to leave America because she wrote a harmless little book called Lesbian Love. He concluded with a prophecy, one of these years, America won't act that way. That those extraordinary words are the single defense of Eve's book published in her lifetime. Bolt's brave words accompanied an affectionate uh, caricature of Eve, uh, which I've included in my book. 
Eve and a dear close uh, live in a companion, Hella Olstein, were living in France when the Nazis invaded in 1940. They were in Paris. They managed to evade trouble by moving south to Nice for three years, but they were both finally arrested and Auschwitz murdered. Um, I was fortunate. Could you, uh, your, your Wi-Fi is going in a bit in and out a little bit, you get, you get stuck. So could you just repeat that part about um, her deportation? I should say her uh, being shifted, uh, yeah. sent to Auschwitz, because I think that got cut. Okay. Eve and her close live with companion Hella Olstein were living in France when the Nadies when the Nazis invaded in 1940. They managed to evade trouble for three years. And that was, that was very clever of them to do, to have they figured out to do that. They were finally arrested, however, and sent to Auschwitz and murdered. I was fortunate that Eve's brother, Yerek Miel, who immigrated to Israel, had a son, and that son, had a son, Eren Zahavi, and very late in my research, of Aaron, and he, Aaron tried to find the family of Eve's companion, Hella Olstein, and sure enough, he was able to find a, a lawyer in Switzerland, Daniel Olstein, whose father was Hella's brother. And sure enough, Daniel Olstein turned out to have an amazing, important collection of letters, a file that the family had saved of letters from Hella and Eve including uh, this uh, passport photo of Eve from 1929, which he had given uh, to her friends and the family, and two photos of Eve and Hella together. And uh, so it was an incredible find. Having El uh, Hella's and Eve's letters to family members also allowed me to communicate the tightening grip of the Nazis in France and the two women's desperate hope to escape. Aiding this for three years, both Hella and Eve were arrested. They were carried from France to Auschwitz in Poland, a Nazi convoy 63, a trip of about three days in a cattle car, which, you know, with air, not, not, you know, a potty to, to pee in. Uh, amazingly, three survivors of Convoy 63 and Auschwitz were, wrote, memories, wrote me memoirs detailing the horror of that Convoy 63 trip. Those descriptions allowed me to convey the horror of Auschwitz itself. Eve Adams' life links diverse pasts, making her life directly to present concerns. Her publishing Lesbian Love makes her central to the history of sexuality, in particular lesbian resistance history. Repeated critical references to Eve's gender bending make her story central to historically changing norms of femininity and masculinity. Eve's story is central to the history of immigration, in particular Jewish the US from Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. Eve's migrations from Poland to the US, to France, and her visits to Berlin, Lon London, and Stockholm make her an international heroine. Eve's history is Polish history, and um, it's French history, and uh, it's American history. It's all kinds of history. And um, it's, uh, it's community history, her, it's surveillance, uh, international history. It's the history of fascism. And unfortunately, it has too much topical relevance, that rise of fascism in Eve's time and its deadly uh, result in her death uh, to our own time. You know, we should all, I think Eve's story uh, 
serves us now. Warning about the horrible things that can happen if good people who want social justice do not get together and work together to make a fairer, more just world. And I guess that's my talk. And I look forward to uh, comments uh, from, Thank you. from you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to just promote the book again and um, just say where it's Chicago Review Press. Um, it's available on their website, it's available on Amazon, and it's, I'm sure it's available at uh, your local bookstore, which one should always um, go to, such as Three Lives and Company in Greenwich Village. Um, thank you again for sharing that synopsis of Eve's life. Um, I mean, clearly her, her adult life was pitted between two really um, kind of difficult periods of surveillance um, one was in the US and the other obviously with the rise of fascism and, and Nazi Germany, which most people understand. In this country though, in the early 20th century, um, there were these social movements that were suppressed and eventually eradicated. Um, could you talk about that in the broader context, like the pacifist movement, the socialist movement, progressive movement early on and, and Woodrow Wilson and and the drive to you know, stop that, which is so relevant today to hearing what young people are doing and why people are marching Black Lives Matter and so forth. Yeah, I, a, a good example of the US government, including J. Edgar Hoover, coming down on a very progressive union movement was the uh, attempt to get rid of, and they did get rid of the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, the IWW, and they either deported them or jailed the leaders or you know, murdered them or whatever. Um, so that's a good example of what, uh, of how repressive the state apparatus was in terms of a progressive movement. It wasn't a, a foreign socialist movement. It had that some people who belonged to those parties, but um, it was a, a, an American movement to ma make better conditions for working people and it was progressive and they uh, um, involved uh, uh, black people and white people together, which was really unusual in the union. Time of it was done in by around 1919. It was just done in completely. Mm -hmm. That's a good example of that. Um, the, the other thing that, you know, we experienced last week by going in, what was, what was Eve's hangout like? I mean, it was well known. It was written about brevities, you know, later in the 30s, wrote about it, sort of reminiscing about it, maybe not so um, nicely, but it was known. And, you know, she was a personality. It's interesting that someone who was so out there, she was fear, she sounded fearless in that her club was a personality club about her. Yeah. Could you talk about that a bit? And you know, the surveillance that took place there? Yeah, clubs that were run by uh, interest, especially interesting people that had a following were called personality clubs. And um, he was certainly one of those types of places. Uh, so um, it's wonderful that the basement of 129 McDougal where East Cafe uh, was, looks exactly like it looked in time. They're doing some construction. I hope they don't change it too much. <laughs> oh. The police woman leader who, who uh, sends in the police woman to entrap Eve says there's pewter on the mantle. And this is a hundred years, like we were talking about a hundred years before, and somehow there's, I wonder, is it the same pewter? You know, it's amazing that it looks, that the, the room hasn't changed uh, much. So I, you can get a, a wonderful feeling of what Eve's looked like by, by looking down in the basement of 129 McDougal. There's a wonderful, uh, just there's a wonderful restaurant uh, on the floor above called La Lanterna. Um, and uh, it's fun to go there and have a meal and walk. So, I mean, in this bathroom, is, th this talks yeah, about so the, the, the bathroom. I'm sorry, you were stuck for a second. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, the, the, you can go downstairs in E129 McDougal and look the place over. Um, you know, I just want to make an aside or a pitch for historic preservation. I mean, that is the power of um, kind of a tangible preservation where you can actually go into the space or see the building on the outside and know that this is exactly what Eve Adams saw and witnessed. Um, the, the, the lesbian love I thought was supposed to have been long lost. This is what you know, I had understood. And I remember running into you uh, probably three years ago at an event and you said, I found a copy. So what, where did you find it in, in terms of, and what did that do in terms of your research? Well, it's, you know, it would have been hard to publish the book without having seen a copy of Lesbian Love. It's very rare. Um, it, the one copy that was in an institution, Yale, disappeared. It's stolen, obviously. Um, and um, I, I was able through a wonderful uh, cooperation of Barbara Kahn, a, a playwright who had done a lot of research for some a couple of plays about Eve. She had been in, she, she was contacted by a woman who found a copy. We lost it. Lobby of her building in, 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 in Albany, New York in 1998, I think it was. And so I was able Jonathan, to- Jonathan, could you just repeat that? I, um, Barbara Kahn, the, a wonderful playwright, had done some plays about Eve Adams. And so she was contacted by uh, Nina Alvarez in, in, uh, uh, who had found a copy of Eve's book, Lesbian Love in the uh, lobby of her building in Albany, New York in 1998 and saved it and thought, oh, this looks interesting. And, you know, and then contacted, contacted Barbara. And so I got back to uh, Nina Alvarez and she was generous enough to share uh, uh, Eve's book with me. And I was then able to analyze it and write about it. And we, we, it, we reprint it as, a, as an appendix to my biography of Eve. So mm -hmm. it's, it's to print it's you know not copyrighted mm -hmm. um i'm going to um look at some of the questions that are in the chat one of them is did eve ever meet um the little ma magazine the little magazine editor uh, margaret anderson well that's um, a good question and i did try to I did try to find out the answer and i never was able oh there contact uh, the, when the Bureau of Investigation agents uh, uh, spy in Eve's hotel room when she's selling radical periodicals, the name Margaret Anderson comes up on a list of people who are subscribed to some pe radical periodical or something like that, that Eve is collecting names for. So, um, but I was it not able, you would think that they might have Um, got to know each other and met at some point, but I was not able to find. I'm hoping that the publication of my biography will uh, encourage new research and that people will look, do more looking uh, for evidence about uh, questions like Margaret Anderson and Eve having some kind you of... Know, to that point, you know, when we were talking about this presentation a couple of weeks ago, um, the question came up, do you think that Henry Gerber um, knew, did they know each other, Eve Adams and Henry Gerber, and Henry Gerber was from Chicago, Jewish, um, you know, it would be an interesting sort of coincidence if they intersected, um, mm -hmm. but that didn't ever, you never came across that. No, not at all. I think I hope he comes back now. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, your, uh, how... your, your Wi-Fi just went out for a few seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know how many lesbians Henry Gerber in Chicago 
was friends with than mm. I think all men in his organization. Mm. Um, one of the questions that came in um, from Craig Howell is, uh, is, is, is Eve's story well known in the Polish LGBT community, which is obviously under heavy attack from the current Polish government? Yes, no, nobody knows about Her story got forgotten. It's a poignant fact. Uh, and, and it suggests that there are many, many more forgotten, amazing stories of LGBT people uh, that can be dug up again if people do the research. I really want to um, talk up for historical evidential research on, on our past. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, which is about, was she deported to Auschwitz because she was Jewish, gay, or both? I would say, assume all of the above. She ticked every box. Well, because she was Jewish, specifically. Yeah. She got in, as I say in the book, she got in the way of the monsters because she was deported from the U.S. using the fact that she was a lesbian and had published this supposedly obscene book. So it's all related and we use the word intersectional and certainly applies to Eve. Um, but the Nazis were arresting Jews. They weren't, um, you know, some lesbians were getting in trouble certainly and arrested and sent to camps. But in Germany at the time uh, made it a uh, crime for gay men to be uh, 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 sexually active, not lesbians. They didn't, it, the laws in Germany didn't specify uh, lesbians in particular, though historians have begun to do research showing that lesbians had a lot of trouble with the Nazis, especially mm. if they were progressive, uh, you know, and went into the Nazi, you know, anti-Nazi uh, activities. Um, you know, one of the things in reading the book um, is how, um, sort of devastating her letters are to the US pleading, as you say, sort of delusionally pleading to come back. If to ask, she was asking for help, uh, which really tells the story of how desperate the situation was getting there. Yes, I was very fortunate to uh, find these letters in uh, the Switzerland uh, collection of is saved. I guess they tend to save more uh, material than maybe other families do because um, they realize how important it is. Um, so that those letters that were in this Olstein collection from Eve, from Hella, dramatically document their increasing uh, terror of the mm -hmm. Nazis getting closer and closer and arresting a guy at their same address, a Polish guy, a month before they were arrested, for instance. Um, you know, there, there's a comment here, have you tried to get the book um, into the schools, the public schools that are requiring LGBT plus uh, curriculum, you know, in New York, uh, I should say New Jersey, California, Colorado, and Illinois. Um, maybe that's a second, uh, effort after you finish your whirlwind tour here. Yeah, I, I would love that. Sure. I've written up a teaching guide to out uh, on and it's on out history to Eve Adams life. And it suggests her life can be integrated into classes on immigration, on US history, on sexual history, gender history. Um, and I have also put lots of the documents online, a major chronology online, um, uh, lots of the pictures actually too. And I'm gonna be putting more online when I have time. It, it, it will be a wonderful, I mean, there's a, an organization, uh, History Unerased, who is getting funding. This is separate from those um, states that mandate it, New York City, um, has a wonderful push to have LGBT plus Q plus curriculum there. And that would, this would be a wonderful sort of teaching tool for that. Um, 
And I just want to comment that Lisa E. Davis, want, you know, there's a great book that sort of also contextualized Eve's life in the early 20th century in Greenwich Village of radical feminists of heterodoxy, Greenwich Village, 1912 to 1940, I do. Uh, by George Schwartz. Judith Schwartz. It's yeah. by Judith. Judith. And uh, she, we, we were active together in recuperating uh, lesbian mm -hmm. gay history early on. Mm. Um, one of the questions came in about your reference to her as a gender bender. Um, what was her sort of gender identification, I should say, her gender presentation um, like during the early 20th century? Okay, the comments don't exactly say exactly what clothes she's wearing or what it is about her. her they do refer to cropped hair a lot, short hair for a woman, you know. Um, um, they don't, you know, I think she wore pants in tramping around the country and didn't wear frilly blouses. So I, I think it was like, you know, it, she looks in, a, in her 1941 passport photo like one of us, like one of uh, a, a, a person today, one of my pals, you know? Um, she's dressed in, in a very similar way in the casual clothes and that are much like our casual clothes. Mm. Um, there's a question that came in. Uh, did she have anything to do with or contribute to Emma Goldman's uh, Mother Earth magazine? Uh, not that I know of, but she did say that she contributed to, and she was she was writing things after she was deported. Writing jail experience in the U.S. Those so far, those writings are lost. They were supposed to be published in Paris in the New Review, um, a sort of leftist periodical in run by an American in Paris, but. As far as I know, they well, I know they they that that magazine closed down before Eve's stories were published, and uh, there's no sign of them that I was able to find, you know. So I'm that's another that's one of the things I hope somebody will find those essays of Eve's and some obscure uh, archive. Mm. Um, all right, are there, I just want to open it up to say if there, anyone has any questions or comments, if anyone from the LGBT sites team wants to make any kind of additions about that area of Greenwich Village and the sites and, and sort of how these small restaurants, tea rooms were operated. They were really sort of welcoming uh, to an LGBT population that was quite visible in the early 20th century. Um, so there was this, this rich expression of life in that, in that neighborhood. Um, if there are not, are there any other questions? I don't see anything coming in. Um, what, what do you think is the, um, are there other, who are the other Eve Adams that we don't know about? I mean, are, have anyone reached out to you about her, her partner, girlfriend in, from Chicago and the you know, Gray Cottage? I mean, because there, this is one story of so many people. I'm just wondering how many other people were deported during that period for similar purposes, similar reasons, I should say. Yeah, uh, at the moment, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there are so many, if you look in my two books about uh, gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual history, uh, there's a lot of names that will be suggested to you of mm. people that you could research. Mm. That can be searched. Yeah, there's so many. There's so many. Um, a question came in, which is um, sort of a, a great way that I wanted to end the sort of conversation. It's almost it's 726. Um, you know, you, you write in the book what Eve means to you, um, and maybe you can sort of talk about that and, and sort of give us some inspiration about her tragic, I mean, she had a rich life, um, yet it ended tragically, and she suffered through much of it, but her spirit seems so, so palpable and so strong, um, and I'm saying that that's what she means to me, but I want to know from you um, what it means, what does she mean to you? Yeah, it's tricky. You know, I had to 
give full justice to her being a Holocaust victim. But on the other hand, she wasn't only a victim by any means. She had, and she was the active agent of her life. And I think that's Uh, and the earlier part of her life was totally fascinating. I, I keep saying the interest is in the details, the things the FBI agents say about her, the things that she says in letters to Ben Reitman. Um, so that's why I sort of urge people to read the book and get the word out about Eve Adams. Fascinating. Um, her life, I mean, it meant a lot to me to do Jewish history. I've never, I know I grew up in a completely non-religious, non-cultural, non-Jewish cultural family, really. Um, and so this has been a learning experience for me. And I, I, I was, it was lovely to embrace my Jewishness in old age. Um, and it meant a lot to me because I, I, I knew a fabulous, wonderful man, a therapist named Herb Freudenberger, who was a, uh, a, not, a survivor of the Nazis, uh, a, a Holocaust survivor as a 13 year old escaping from Nazi Germany. I've written about him in the, at the end of uh, the book, because I think Eve's story will mean different things to different people, depending on our own life histories and who we knew and I do say at the very end of the book that I think, I, I, I imagine seeing Eve way off in the distance and, oh, she's yelling, jumping up and down and she's yelling something. I, I can't quite hear it. And then I do hear it and she's saying, don't mourn, organize. And mm. I think that's a really good way to sum up my feeling about the importance of her story now. I, at the end of the book, I imagine um, Eve seeing her way off in the distance, a little figure, and uh, she's, she's jumping up and down, and she's waving her arms, and she's yelling something, and I can't hear it, and then I hear it, and I hear her yelling, don't mourn, organize. And I think that's a good message that she is sending us via you know, uh, uh, tele telepathy uh, right for today. And, I, that's yeah, and, 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 the, and the fact of the organized surveillance against her to suppress uh, resistance and progressive ideals is so clear and frightening um, as we live this world now. Um, uh, someone is commenting in here that they're proud that you're also an alum of the Little Red Schoolhouse, Elizabeth Irwin, which is on our map, only a few blocks away from Eve's Hangout. Um, but uh, Founded by a lesbian, Elizabeth right. Irwin and her partner, I forget her partner's name at the moment, but um, yeah, that was not, oh yes, it was something my mother gossiped about. I remember that. So it's a bit of queer history that I heard as a child. <laughs> well, as we say, we, we like, our, our website is based on scholarly research. However, in some cases, those scholars are using gossip and hearsay uh, to, to make the case in, uh, in the history of, of earlier 20th century and late 19th century lesbian and, and gay men. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's been wonderful to hear directly from you. I congratulate you and thank you for sharing this hour with us. Um, again, the book is really compelling, um, but if you tie the book to place, if you go to 129 McDougal Street and stand in front of that and just walk that area of McDougal Street, it's a wonderful way to sort of have this understanding of what Greenwich Village was like in the early 20th century and how it is morphed today into another version of, of life and LGBT life in, in the neighborhood. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Jonathan, and I look forward to you joining us at other events and for more information you can go to our website
which is in the link, um, or you could follow us on Instagram. So thanks everybody. And feel free to email um, the project with any questions that you didn't get asked today or would like to have asked. Thank you.